In today's video, we are going to chat about some interior design questions that you may be too embarrassed to ask. You may be saying, Kiva, that is such a stupid question. I would never ask that question. I have too much pride. Well, I don't have any pride. So I've asked all of these questions. I'm gonna answer all these questions and you're gonna walk away from today's video with some actual interior design fundamentals. So let's get into today's video. So the first design question you may be too embarrassed to ask is, why can't I match the color that has been painted on my walls? Now, I love this question. Now this question, it makes me angry. It really grinds my gears. It really gets me going because no one tells you this stuff and it's so freaking annoying. But the reason why you cannot match the paint color on your walls is that if you live in a development, they didn't go out there with their little paintbrush and paint your walls. This They, they were not doing the Sistine Chapel. They didn't, they didn't have that level of detail. What they did is they got a paint sprayer, they filled it up with paint and water, and they threw it on your walls. And I, you know, your painter, he was not a chemist. He didn't go, he didn't go, oh, there's one gallon of this, and then I'm gonna put in two cups of that. He was like, I'm just gonna throw it in, and I hope it looks good. Let's hope it looks good and we're gonna put it on the wall. And that's what they did. And it might look fantastic, but because you don't know the exact ratio of paint to water and because you probably aren't using a paint sprayer, it doesn't look the same when you plant that paint on the wall. So if you're going to the store and you're like, well, they told me it was da 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 by da 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 and you go to that paint store and you're like, okay, can I have this? And then you put it on the wall and then it looks funny. It's not your fault. It's their fault because they didn't actually tell you the correct thing. They didn't tell you the ratio of paint to water. Therefore, it just doesn't look the same. So you actually aren't doing anything wrong so going forward you can either write a contract in like as a part of your contract with your house they have to come in and touch up the paint for a certain number of years or you can just have them paint out of a paint can so that you can actually go to the the hardware store or whatever store and pick up the exact paint and make sure that you can get a perfect color match question number two is how do i remove a command strip you might be saying why are you talking about this well the reason being that command strips can be really fantastic tools for decorating if you're in a rented space or you're just in a space where you don't really want to fix the holes in the wall. You don't really want to go through that. Or, you know, you have cement or concrete walls and you just literally can't get into them. I often find that when people don't know how to use a command strip appropriately, they just don't decorate their walls. And it just looks, it looks really sad in there. It looks really sad and you don't want your house to look like that. So I'm going to tell you how to remove it. So this, this blew my mind. This blew my mind and it blew my mind because I just simply read the back of the package. But I saw the command strips or you know the the off-brand command strips and I said I don't need to read you. You're not my master. I can figure this out. Well apparently they were right and that's how they keep making money because we keep making the same mistakes. So to remove a command strip you can't pull it to the left or the right. There's gonna be a tab on the bottom. You have to pull it straight down. You have to pull it straight down. There isn't going to be a bruise to your wall at all. People just try all types of things. They try to pull it to the left, to the right. They're like doing the cha-cha slide with the tab. It's just like very unnecessary. Just pull it straight down and the command hook will be released. It's very, 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 very simple, but it's something that we don't think about because we just think we know best. Now, if you really can't get that command strip off, get your blow dryer. Like I don't have one because I don't have hair, so I'd have to go buy one, but go get your blow dryer and just put that up against that command hook and that will loosen the adhesive. Then pull it down and it will come right off. You will not have to worry about damaging your wall. So then you can decorate if you're in a rented space or otherwise. Now this has to be my favorite question of all. What is the perfect level for my artwork? So I posted this on Instagram the other day and there was, there was a lot of controversy. So I'm just going to answer it flat out. The perfect place for your art to be is 57 inches. I don't want that to be the top of your artwork. I want the center of your artwork to be at 57 inches tall. 57 inches, that's where we want the center of that piece of art to be. Why did we choose 57 inches? I did not choose anything, but 57 inches is the choice because that is the average eye level. Now, in the comments, someone's already typing. They're saying, well, my eye level is 52 inches. I'm not talking about you. <laughs> I'm talking about standard eye level. If we're looking at all the people, right, that eye level, because that's what we wanna do. We wanna think about how the standard person would be in the space. Now, you're gonna say, Kiva, don't you have a painting that's not at, at eye level? I sure do. You can really do whatever you want, but as a rule, you want the center of the painting to be at eye level. Now this applies whether you have really tall ceilings or really short ceilings. Um, we're talking about mostly the standard eight foot ceiling. We want 57 inches. Now, if you have 15 foot ceilings, we want to shift that artwork upward, but we don't want that artwork to be touching the ceiling. That's not right because then you have to 
look up like this. We're not built to look like that. You're like sitting in the front row of a movie theater to be able to see art in your own house. That's ridiculous. You've already paid for it. Um, you don't want that. So you just want to shift it up a little bit. You still want to be able to see it without straining your neck. That is the entire goal here. Now, it, there, there are a lot of exceptions to this rule, but 57 inches is the answer. Now, I want to chat a little bit about lighting. What is the difference between Kelvin and Lumen? Now, if you've never heard either of those terms, that's fine with me. That's totally fine. Kelvin, we're not talking about a person in this instance. I do want to say that. So uh, Kelvin, we're just talking about how warm or cool the light is, right? Because when you go into a room, you'll see really, really bright light and you'll see really, really warm light. So there is a light behind me. It's very yellow, therefore it's warm. Cool light has some blue to it. So warm light has yellow and orange and cool light has blue. Then lumen, a lumen is a measure of brightness. So how much light something really does give off, how bright it is. Those are the two differences. And the reason I wanted to talk about this is because sometimes I go to the light bulb aisle and I'm like, what are they saying? I have no idea what they're saying. I don't understand the differences and I kind of, I just grab all the light bulbs and I'm like, maybe one of them will work. And then I just have a closet full of light bulbs um, that don't work with anything. But that's the difference there. So different rooms require different Kelvin of light and then different rooms require different lumens, right? So you need to think about both when you are selecting a light bulb for each room in your house. And since we touched on Kelvin, let's address this common design question. What's the difference between warm and cool light? Well, I just told you, but let's talk about it one more time. Warm light is light that has yellow and orange in it. So it comes off as yellow and orange. Cool light is light that comes across as blue or almost pure white. So those are the difference between the lights, but where do you use them? You only ever see really, really cool white light in hospitals. You really only see them in hospitals. You can have some cool light in your kitchen or in your bathroom. I mean, places where you really, really, really want to be able to see well, but in general, in your house, you're going to actually use warm light. Warm light is just a little bit more inviting and fun. Now, if you come to my house, you'll notice that I don't have too much of that because I don't like it. But in general, that is what people do use in their homes. So from now on, if you see something that um, is very, very cool light, just don't buy it. It's not for you. And the higher the number, the cooler the light is going to be. So this next question, what does the number on the light bulb mean? Now, it's not too long ago I'm not gonna give you a date because I don't want to tell you but not too long ago I was like what do these numbers mean is it a particular light bulb sold by a company I really I really did think that I had no idea what the numbers meant but if you see e26 e12 e this a that when you see any of those things you're like what does that mean like is Ikea just sending me on a witch hunt no it actually is the base of the bulb so it lets you know what the base of that light bulb looks like so that light bulb can be matched up with a lamp base. So each lamp just has like a different base and you just need to make sure that they can screw together. That number has absolutely nothing to do with the type of light it gives off. So it has nothing to do with the lumens or the degree Kelvin, right? So it doesn't really give you any useful information whether, except for, is it going to fit in my lamp, right? Because you never want to be in one of those positions where you're like, oh, I did this. I'm so excited to turn this light on and the light bulb doesn't fit. It's like you don't want to get a chandelier light for, I don't know, like your task lamp, right? It just doesn't make any sense. So that is really all that tells you. Now the next design question I want to talk about is what is the difference between a comforter and a duvet? And when we talked about this over on TikTok, I got so many questions that said, are Americans okay? So <laughs> I kind of want to talk about this today. So you're like, what's the difference between a comforter and a duvet? I know this, I'm going to skip this one. Maybe don't, maybe don't skip it. So a duvet is pretty much something that's fluffy and it goes inside of a duvet cover. You're gonna say, isn't that a comforter? They can be one and the same, a duvet and comforter. It is a feather or fluff filled blanket, right? That has the different pockets in it, right? That keeps you warm, but duvets have duvet covers. So like the really fun covers that you see where they're pink and they're blue, um, but the duvet itself is white. And then you have comforters and the comforters have a cover on them, but a non-removable cover. So comforters have non-removable covers and duvets do not have a cover but you can add a cover to them so you can swap them out. The benefit to having a duvet instead of a comforter is that you only have to watch wash the cover frequently because that is the only thing you're in contact with. You don't have to watch the actual duvet it the duvet itself very often. Whereas with a comforter your face is touching that cover all night long. So whatever you're doing in your bed which is not my business at all but whatever you're doing you're getting all of that on that comforter and that means that it needs needs to go in the laundry. 
it needs to go in the laundry, right? It needs to go in the laundry. It should therefore be going in the laundry like once a week, depending upon what you're up to, but once a week. And face products, dirt, dogs, dogs track in a lot of stuff. You're like, cause you guys, you guys judge me for having a dog that wears clothes, but he doesn't track in anything. But you know, you have to wash that more regularly. With a duvet cover, you can just switch it out every week and put in the laundry. You can forget about that cover, put a new cover on, it doesn't matter. You kind of just like live your life. So that is the dif difference between a duvet and a comforter. It just has to do with whether or not the cover is removable. But I see a lot of people using duvets without a duvet cover. So then if you want to treat it like a comforter, that's fine with me, but please wash it, right? And a lot of the time it's hard to wash in your big washing machine because you might not have that big of a washing machine or you don't want to pay for the cost. So then you have to get it dry cleaned or take it to the laundromat. It is just an ordeal. I know because my grandma used to make me do it. Ours didn't fit in our washing machine. So she'd send me to the laundromat and I'd have to sit there for like five hours waiting on like five duvets. And I was like, why do you own so many? There are only two people who live here. But anyway, I digress. So that is the difference between a duvet and comforter. It's something really simple, but something very, very, very important. Next question, and I'm gonna tell you a personal, a, a little funny story here. So when do I need a box spring? So it was 2018. I was a senior in college. Babe and I, we first moved, we just moved into our first apartment. We got a bed from Ikea. We were living the life and we didn't realize that we needed a pole and a box spring and our bed fell through into the floor. And then we went back to Ikea and we said, our bed broke, what's wrong? And we brought back one singular piece of wood and they were like, are you okay? So when do you need a box spring? You need a box spring when you don't have a bed slats, right? So you need a box spring um, most of the time because you need something that's actually going to help you hold your mattress up otherwise you're going to go flying onto the floor you're going to go flying onto the floor and that never feels good having had that happen to us you know we really bonded then having had that happen to us it's not something you would ever like to experience it's quite uncomfortable so you need a box spring if your bed doesn't come with slats if your bed comes with slat you need a pole in the middle a central pole that provides support and the slats on top and then you can have your mattress if you do not have that, you will need a pole and you will also need a box spring. You need the pole no matter what you're doing. Please remember that. Or one day you're just going to go and that's not going to be a good luck. So that's when you need a box spring. You also may not need a box spring if you get a bed that says box spring not required. <laughs> and I know that that's really simple, but I do want to say that. And the only way they're going to say that is when it has the slats. Now, another time you may not need a box spring is when you get something like that metal bed base I always recommend. I love that bed base because it can hold tons of weight and you can fit so much stuff under it. That base has so much support that you do not require a box spring. So you can just put your mattress on top of it. It's just a way to kind of save you some money. But in general, you either need a box spring or you need slats, but you rarely, well, you literally never need both. You never need both. And if someone at the furniture store is trying to sell you that, go to a different furniture store. They're just not doing their jobs. Next question, what's a stud? And I don't mean a really, really, really attractive man. That's not what I mean at all. I would never talk about that and you guys know why. But what is a stud? A stud is the framing in your wall. If you live in an older house, you probably have wooden studs. If you live in a newer house, you probably have metal studs. Metal studs are great, but metal studs will break up your relationship because they're really hard to drill into. Why do we need studs? We need studs to literally hold up the house, right? And so if you're putting up a TV, you're putting something heavy, you wanna drill into the studs so that there's something holding it up. Otherwise, you're just drilling into drywall and it's going to crumble around you in a very, very, very unpleasant way. In terms of spacing of a stud, you will find likely find a stud every 16 to 24 inches, but sometimes they like to have fun in there and kind of leave you hanging for a few inches and leave you scared, really leave you on your toes, or at least that's what the people did who built in my house. So that's what a stud is. They're really important. You really need them to hold things up. Like this TV behind me, it's in some studs. It's not in as many studs as Samsung recommended, but it is in some studs and that's great. We need the studs. If you have wooden studs, you just need to get a stud finder and you can get one from your local hardware store and you can use that to find the wood. Now, if you have metal studs, you can actually just download an app. You know, it's not free though. I think it's a dollar 99 and I didn't like that because not only did it cost money, but it told me that my studs were way too far apart, but you can do that if you have metal studs and it'll just beep and then the beeping will get louder when you get closer to the stud, which is fantastic. What's the difference between a king and a California king? Um, you know, I thought that there was a huge difference after Rihanna wrote that entire song about it and I was very disappointed to find out that there's 
not very much difference at all. So a king bed is just four inches longer, also four inches more narrow. I will say at the end of the day, whenever I uh, am buying sheets, I'll buy the same sheets for both beds because they sometimes, they, t they tend to make the sheets like really big anyway, so it really doesn't matter. I feel like when they hike up the prices, that's just not fair. There is very, very, very little difference between them. Now, if you want a massive bed and you thought the California King was gonna be it, but it's not, you want an Alaskan King. You're gonna have to have that custom made. I don't quite know where you're gonna put it, but you can do it. No. What's the difference between bar stools, counter stools, and dining chairs? Bar stools on average are between 20 to 28 inches tall when it comes to seat height. Counter stools are between 24 and 26 inches high when it comes to seat height. So you will notice that there really truly is a two inch difference in the seat height when it comes to bar stools and counter stools because bar stools needs to be higher because you need to be able to reach the bar. Same thing with the counter stool, it needs to be lower because you don't wanna sit so that your knees are touching the counter. So I know we all run into this sometime. We'll go into a store, we'll go to Marshalls or TJ Maxx and we'll find these really, really cute bar stools and we bring them home and we're like, oh, we can make this work and you can only fit like one leg in there trying to sit at your island it's it's not a vibe or you're, you're sitting so low that your chin and the countertop are kind of aligning you don't want to do that you want to make sure that you're getting the correct seat height for the correct location so you just need to get your tape measure out and measure uh, the height of the counter or the height of the bar and then you can actually just put it into Google and figure it out that is the easiest way to do it next question how should I hang my curtains so this one this one always causes some controversy. I always have someone down in my comments writing something really rude about me and I'm like, it's not my fault. I'm not the curtain. It's not my fault. And it's mostly flack for the way I say curtain. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. So, you know, cut me some slack. But the way you hang curtains is really important. See, I'm correcting myself because I know you're going to judge me. Look what you've done. So when it comes to hanging them up, you want to make sure that they're not the exact same size as the window. If they're the exact same size as the window, then you're completely covering up the window. You can't actually pull them so that any of the window is really exposed, right? Because they have to have some place to occupy. You want to make sure that your curtains are at least, if you can do it, a foot wider than the window on either side. If you can't do a foot, at least give me six inches, but a foot on either side. In terms of the height of the curtain, when it's really, really low, when it's literally touching your molding or your window, it just makes the entire room feel flat. It makes it feel small. It, you're literally just pulling something down and pulling down the light. I don't want it to touch the ceiling. I don't want it to touch the ceiling. People say do that and I say that's really hard to drill. It might look nice, it's very hard to drill. I'm not gonna put you through that, right? You're not Bob the Builder. You don't need to have to, you don't need any of that grief. But you wanna get it as close to the ceiling as possible, as close as possible. But if you have to sacrifice where the curtains kind of meet the floor so that they can be higher up, I don't want you to do that. I'd rather you place them down lower. Your curtains to just, kiss the floor. They should kiss the floor. They should kiss the floor like your dog does when you tell him not to do it. That's how as low as they should be. They shouldn't be any lower. I don't want them pooling on the floor. That looks nice. Like if you live in a mansion and you have someone cleaning all day long, but you just kind of collect dust bunnies. And again, Swiffer doesn't sponsor us. We cannot do that, right? So we want them to just kiss the floor, just graze the floor. And we want them to be as close to the ceiling as possible. But if you say you have some sort of furnace or something, obviously I'm not talking to you. I'm not saying, put your house at risk of burning down so that you can follow these design rules. Obviously that, that is not what I'm saying. It doesn't apply to you, but otherwise that's how I want you to go about it. Now this one may be the most stupid question of all, but I do want to address it because I really believe that there are no stupid questions. And I, I really believe that because I am a person who will ask every and any question I could possibly come up with. I've had many, many teachers dislike me in the past. So the next question, the final question I wanna talk about is how do I know if something is too small in a space? And my answer is very, very simple. Look at it, look at it. Most of us know we have a an innate uh, awareness of scale, right? We do know this. If you have to ask yourself, is this too small? It is too small. You're just trying to play yourself because you don't want to have to take it back to the store. You don't want to admit that you just dragged your husband out of bed at 2 a.m. to hang something on the wall that you knew was too small. You want to be like, oh yeah, that looks great. That looks fantastic, honey. See, I knew I was right. You were wrong, okay? You're just going to have to bite the bullet on this one. You'll win the next argument. But if you want to know if something is too small, 
just look at it, just look at it um, and go on the internet. The internet is an amazing place, right? You don't have to open your encyclopedia all the time anymore. You can just type it into Google, right? Um, what is the standard size of art I should put above this media console? Or go online and use a free modeling software. There are so many ways to find out the appropriate scale of things. But normally, if you have to ask, is this too small? It's too small. Okay, you guys, that's it for today's video. Those were some you know, kind of stupid, kind of silly design questions that you're probably too embarrassed to ask, but you shouldn't be. Someone should have told you the answers and I told you the answers in today's video. Are there any other questions you've been too embarrassed to ask? I'm here to answer them because no questions are stupid questions and this is a safe place for you. If you liked today's video, please don't forget to subscribe, like this video and check me out on Instagram. And until next time, have a beautiful day.